Okay, we're going to look at, um, where were we? Where were we anyway? Yeah, we're in Genesis, and we got to, um, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he, he. And I guess what I wondered, how, how do you discern when you're talking, when you're reading Scripture, that you're reading about the, the culture, the facts, mm-hmm. and, and where God is? Where's the spiritual part of that? How do you discern between when you're, when you're looking at Scripture? Well, uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, now, there's various aspects of where the Spirit will be. And one is in the account that we're reading about, and I think that's where your question is, is uh, how can you try to discern what is God's place in this story and what is in the imaginations of or in the uh, style of storytelling what is exaggerated and what is, um, you know, really not exaggerated, what is symbolic, and what was, what was the real experience. That's, that's what I'm wondering. When you, when you just hear those words, yeah. it, it evokes images. Yeah. <clears throat> and some of the images in regards to the whale, I mean, there's all sorts of oh, yeah. areas where whale is and the living water. Yeah, yeah, what are they talking about? And and there that's something we can't know for sure and that's the whole process of biblical scholarship. There's the other side of where is the spirit of God in these ordinary No, no, no. The other side is where is the spirit of God with me, the one reading this story. And there's um, often in, in a lot of our tradition that in reading the story, somehow God will speak to me. It's irrelevant whether the story happened or not, but in reading the story, do I get an insight? Do I feel my heart strangely warmed, as John Wesley said? And do I have an, uh, a sense of God's presence with me as I'm studying these words? And that's, like I said, that part's totally irrelevant of what happened way back then and what the style is, that if in the process of meditating and thinking about these stories, do I have a sense that God is with me now? God has given me this insight of how I should live or what I should do. So, and that's the more important part. You know, am I connecting with God and sensing God's will for my life or do I, do I get this sense of, you know, kind of goosebumps or, <laughs> or, you know, a little extra pounding in my heart of excitement that, oh my gosh, God is with me here. God is guiding my thinking. As I'm reading this story, it's making me come in tune with some truths I've been avoiding, and they've come home to rest with me. So, yeah, yeah, a good question. Okay, we were at, um, in the 28th verse, and then he, he's, uh, Jacob is left, and he's heading off um, for Haran, he's running away from Esau, and at the end of that, it's so Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put under his head and he set it up for a pillar, not a pillow, but a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it and he called that place Bethel. Uh, but the name of the city was Luz at first, and then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way, that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace. 
Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I surely give one-tenth to you. Excuse me, Bill. I've got to put a reserve sign on something. They're very concerned about it in the TV crew, and they want to be sure these two seats... Are reserved. So this is the best time for me to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, now, as we've uh, discussed before, uh, and I may be reviewing a little bit, but I'm going to pick up where we were and then go from there. Uh, it seems a part of our human nature in response to an encounter with the divine, whether in our times or the, the folks we're reading about, uh, this sensing or feeling, this ominous presence of the spiritual, we want to erect something as a symbol, uh, as a memorial. We want to consecrate this place and say, it is holy. Now, holy means set apart and special. Now, it doesn't get set apart unless human beings set it apart. And it doesn't get the sense of holy unless we sense it's holy, set apart, special. Um, And so we do so uh, with our cemeteries and our battlefields uh, where great sacrifice for honorable causes has been made. And if um, we do this, then... Uh, It's a way we give witness or testimony to tell the story about that experience and to tell the story about why this is a special place Um, so it won't be forgotten and that it will be honored and taken care of. So if it's a cemetery, it'll be mowed and trimmed and flowers will be placed. If it's a sanctuary, it'll be a nice building that will be kept up. And so we give witness and testimony by the way we care for and remember those places. So we at Boston Avenue, we believe that this is a sacred space, that this is a place where we are inspired, that we have a sense of feeling God's presence with us. Uh, And so not only do we erect the building, we erect the scaffolding so that we can care for it and keep it looking nice. And, uh, and, and the, this is a part of the uh, keeping it sacred, set apart and special. We don't let it get run down uh, and just decay because then that looks like it's not special. It's not set apart. It just Uh, something that when we get tired of it, we can just let it fall into decay and tear it down and do something else with it. But when it's sacred, we don't let that happen. Uh, We keep it it nice. Now, I thought it was interesting that Jacob responds not only by erecting the altar, but he makes this vow that if God keeps God's promise to be with him and to protect him, as God freely chose to make the promise to him. He didn't go asking for it. It was freely given to him. And so in response, he accepts and embraces God to be his God and uh, makes this abode and meaning. But the promise of the tenth is not asked of him from God, but Again, that's a free response to what God has promised to do for him, but it is uh, a promise to make an offering if God fulfills God's promises. So he doesn't start throwing money in the offering plate at the moment, but he promises that if God is faithful, uh, as God was promising to be with him, then he would make a tenth of all that God would give to him. Now, since there wasn't much organized religion yet, 
This was the beginning. They weren't having worship services every week and passing the offering plate at that time. <clears throat> but this is an early uh, gesture. Now, what, what it could be, if we translated it into our terms today, he would have gone to his attorney and he would have adjusted his will to give a remainder designation of all that's left when I die, 10% goes to the church. And so uh, there are different ways of honoring that commitment to respond to God's grace and, uh, and giving. A lot of folks will say, I just can't afford to do it now. I'm afraid, um, you know, I'll outlive my resources. But if if one wanted to give that thank offering, then adjusting the will and, and giving uh, a gift to the church would be a way of giving that thank offering uh, later. Now, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who I've mentioned several times before, but he went the longest time skipping over a lot of the passages that we were covering uh, before he started writing more commentary, and when we got to, uh, to Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Esau, he's written a lot of reflections on that, like so many people uh, who who write um, commentary on the Genesis story and the patriarchs, because there's a lot of stuff in these stories with Jacob and Esau and uh, Isaac and Rebecca. So, uh, I wanted to look at one of them that was dealing with Isaac that we kind of really didn't stop and look at Isaac. Uh, and I wanted to go back and, and deal with that before we go on with Jacob <clears throat> as he goes off and, uh, and starts uh, trying to find a wife um, and has to deal with Laban. Um, in several places, I encounter the scholars ascribing to Isaac a particular virtue among the patriarchs. And that virtue that was given was Isaac symbolizes persistence. Persistence. Now, Sachs entitles his essay about this theme, The Courage of Persistence. And he goes back to the account of the famine and Isaac and Rebekah going down into the land of the Philistines where King Abimelech lived. That's one of those three stories about the, the rape or the threat to the matriarch. Uh, and saying that, uh, and when they got there, they said they're brother and sister because they didn't want people to think he was the husband, and if they killed him, then they could take this beautiful woman as their wife. And so uh, when Abimelech finds out, when he sees them caressing one another, then he says, you can't be brother and sister. Something's going on here. So he calls Isaac in, and he chastises him for being dishonest. And Isaac says he was afraid. Uh, but uh, Abimelech evidently is afraid of Isaac's God um, because he sees that God has, is blessing him in special ways. So he issues the strong protective order to protect Isaac and Rebekah uh, so that no one would harm them and then bring on the wrath of God onto him and their people. So, and then he also says, you may settle anywhere here within my lands. You pick the place, it is yours, uh, and you will have like a protective order from me, the king of this land, that no one should, should harm you or your wife, Rebecca. And yet, nevertheless, in spite of that, there is trouble anyway. Uh, there's conflict over the wells, the watering rites. Uh, and remember in that story that Isaac... Uh, had gone there because of the famine. So still, even though right now with our rains, we've had a lot of rains, but the weather folks will say, but we're still, you know, we've, we've had maybe more than we usually get this time of year, but we've got 
several, several inches of rainfall that hadn't been there. So we're still short for the accumulative amount of rain that we should be having that would soak into the ground and fill our lakes and ponds and reservoirs. So we're still kind of in drought conditions. So even though he had gone down to this place uh, where the Philistines were because they had more water, but it was still still in some drought conditions. So they needed the wells uh, and the water there. Now, in spite of that, it says Isaac planted crops, which seemed kind of strange because he heard sheep and goats. When did he learn how to plant crops? But anyway, he planted them anyway. And he planted them in the land, and the crops yielded a hundredfold because the Lord had blessed him. Now, he continues to grow in wealth. Not only the crops, but his herds grew, and his, his sheep and goats and cattle, and the Philistines became envious. And they filled in his wells that he had dug. And earlier they'd filled in the wells of Abraham. But anyway, Abimelech um, comes back and, and he's complaining. And then he just says, you should move away from us because you've become too powerful for us. And uh, which meant you've become too wealthy and prosperous and we're envious. But we know that it is your God who blessed you, so we're afraid of your God. You make us uncomfortable. Just move away from us. So Isaac moves away. He's very conciliatory. And his servants open new wells and reestablish the wells of Abraham. And the Philistines got mad and they filled up the wells. And then some of the herdsmen of Gerar. Uh, quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying that the, the water was theirs and that he should go away. So he moves on and he digs another well. And then the herdsmen around there quarrel again. And then he has to dig another well. And finally, he, the third time he goes and he digs a well and no one quarrel, quarrels with him about that. And finally, he can live in peace and prosper. Now, Sachs says that these three aspects of this, there are three aspects of the passage that tell us a lot about this uh, encounter that um, we just kind of go on and, and kind of skim over it. But, and this is very interesting why I thought we needed to go back and look at this. He said, one, you have become too powerful for us. And he says, those are the same words, the same expression that Pharaoh will later say to the Hebrews who went down to Egypt in a famine and stayed there. And they stayed and prospered. And, the, and then the Pharaoh says, you've become too powerful for us in numbers and strength. And if anybody comes to attack us and you join with them then we will be overcome. And so they tried to figure out how can they do something about that. And then that begins the beginning of the enslaving of, of the uh, Hebrew people, and they're having too many kids, so he sends the midwives in to kill their babies. And, I mean, it becomes a very bad situation. But why? They have prospered. They've become strong. So that same word is A-T-Z-U-M, atzum, means power or powerful, and it appears in both those passages. Sachs and other Jewish scholars say that this passage with Isaac is the birth of one of the deadliest of human phenomenon, anti-Semitism. This is the birth of anti-Semitism. Now, we Christian folk reading over these stories in our Bibles, we're looking for a connection with Jesus and uh, looking in the Old Testament for ways of understanding Jesus. We're not thinking about being Jewish. And so, but the Jewish people uh, are sensitive about anti-Semitism for good reason. Uh, and 
there are ways that in our culture now we don't think anti-Semitism is such a terrible thing anymore. We seem to kind of have resolved it um, to some extent, and maybe we think it's it's maybe gone away, but it uh, it really hasn't. Um, we uh, we sometimes think that once a, a minority has found its place in society, that that they've gotten there, and there isn't the uh, oppression or anti-Semitism uh, or racism and so forth. But um, I mean, it's sort of like some people say, "Well, we've elected a black president; we've gotten over racism." Well, we understand, no. We haven't. In fact, it seems that electing a black president has increased a lot of racism among some people. But it was kind of interesting. I spent last week at camp. Do you all remember I said I was going off to camp? Well, we had a really good good group of kids that I was working with. It was our graduates the ones that have just graduated high school, and they're all going off to college, and there are 14 of them. And most of them were our Boston Avenue kids, but there were some a few kids from, from other places. Um, but on our last uh, morning, <clears throat> when we were kind of reviewing uh, the camp, and some of the kids were talking about what had happened the night before, because it was the last night, and, and they were kind of hyper, and they weren't wanting... Uh, to go to sleep right away and and all. And there was one incident that was troubling, and we were processing that. And then a couple of the boys that weren't in my cabin, they were in another cabin, They, this one, he wanted to tell about the Jew jokes that they were telling last night, or night before last. And he wanted to tell us about them. And I'm very proud. It was one of our Boston Avenue kids in our group who just flat out told him, I have no interest in listening to Jew jokes. Now, we had previously had a, a discussion in the curriculum about there are times when Christians need to stand up for what's right in spite of what's popular and what's acceptable in the culture or in their culture. And it takes courage to do something like that and just say, I'm not interested in hearing Jew jokes. I'm not going to participate in something that may just cross over the line and become anti-Semitic. And so I was very proud. And I was proud of the boy because he said, oops, oh yeah. Basically acknowledged he was right, he shouldn't be doing that. And backed off and... And that and that was was a good thing. Yes. Oh yeah. And in Christianity. Yeah. Y- yeah. It's uh, and you know part of the problem is there are a lot of really successful Jewish comedians mm-hmm. and and people in. Uh, in the entertainment world. And, and it's one thing when someone can poke fun at themselves. And, you know, it's, it's funny because we do have unique characteristics as, you know, various groups um, and persons. And if we can, you know, make fun of ourselves and laugh at ourselves and be self-effacing... That's one thing. It's another thing when we, someone else is making fun of in the sense of ridiculing and putting down as a way of picking on or saying, <clears throat> you've got flaws as a way of calling attention to somebody's flaws and weaknesses as if I can criticize because I'm so much better. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, um, and it's kind of like, well, some of the young people, when they're in their uh, developing stages in middle school and all, you know, we don't want people picking on us, so we call attention to somebody else. 
and as, as a self-defense kind of thing, so they won't turn on us. Um, but that's that's not a good thing. But anyway, um, the um, the Jew jokes are are still out there, and uh, and sometimes, like I say, because comedians of a group, and then there's a lot of really funny black communi- uh, comedians who will make fun of you know their culture uh, but unfortunately what when they do that a flip side of the coin is that it kind of says well it's okay to make fun of black folks or jewish folks because of their some of their unique characteristics of their culture and their style uh, and so um, we have to be very careful about becoming offensive when we may not mean to be, but uh, it's it's something that that is it's hard to draw the line of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, so anyway, the uh, the aspect of what was happening uh, in the time of of Jacob and in the time of Isaac. The, the point is that there is anti-Semitism and it has characteristics. But the characteristics aren't completely unique and set apart from other oppressions and other ways of stigmatizing uh, some people. But in analyzing this text and, and other situations, um, they do say that there's something unique about anti-Semitism And that is, it's the world's longest hatred. I mean, these passages of the patriarchs are thousands of years before Jesus. And then it's been over 2,000 years since Jesus, and and we still have it. Uh, It's taken many shapes and forms for thousands of years. However, it does share some common characteristics with some other groups of people being oppressed. And he says... Uh, points to a book, uh, Amy Chow's book, World on Fire, in which she analyzes the history of anti-Semitism and sees that uh, when it happens, there are three elements. One is the people who are receiving the attacks are conspicuously successful minorities, and they will attract envy, conspicuously successful minorities attract envy that then may deepen into hatred and then that will provoke the violence. And he says all three of these conditions are essential. The hated group must be conspicuous. It must be different enough to be identifiable within their culture. It must have identifiable characteristics. And without the conspicuous characteristics, then the members of that group can't be identified as being different from anybody else. They're just not recognized as different. And so there has to be some conspicuous characteristics. Now, if... uh, And then the second is, they must be successful, if they're not successful, there's no reason for the envy. There's no reason for the envy if they're not very successful. And then, <clears throat> uh, for example, if, if the oppression is such that they're held down uh, by slavery or, uh, or different rules, a uh, caste system that makes them not be able to be successful then there's no sense of, of envy because their conditions are, are so bad because of what's happened in the culture, of, in their oppression. They're not envied. They're no threat. And then the third uh, criterion is they must be a minority because if they're not a minority, then they're not an easy target. If you're in the ma- majority... You know, you just, uh, people are going to be afraid because if you're in the majority, your side, your group will squash a minority who's 
trying to attack you. I mean, they just they just won't be doing it. You have, which means being in the minority means you uh, have a vulnerability to being attacked. So all these conditions were the case with Isaac. He was not a Philistine. He was different. He was a stranger. And he was conspicuously an outsider. He had a different faith. He had some different customs. And he was very successful. He planted crops and they yielded a hundredfold. His flocks increased. His herds increased. And it says he was envied. And third, he was obviously a minority. He was just one little family in this foreign culture of great numbers. Now, the same was true of the Hebrews down in Egypt. Uh, Sachs refers to another book, The Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arndt. And she had pointed out in her book, the hostility toward Jews is dangerous, not when the Jews are strong. And she looked at uh, 20th century times, uh, but when the Jews as a group were weak. They're still prosperous and still identifiable group, but their minority status uh, was even uh, made more vulnerable because they didn't have any strong leaders in the culture, in the uh, business world or in the government. And when they didn't have strong leaders in positions of authority and influence, then that's when the attacks seem to begin and to start in in times uh, and in different, some in France and in in Russia and in Germany, that they didn't have the strong positions of power. So they were in a weak position. However, they were still successful and had wealth. So when the Jews were successful, had wealth, and Uh, also had uh, those positions, then they didn't come under attack. But when they didn't have the power in the culture, then the anti-Semitism did surface. And so, um, anyway, that historical analysis, uh, I thought, was very helpful to me uh, to, to understand some of those dynamics. And that was, again, Isaac's position, wealth without power in the the culture. It's why he was so conciliatory, and he kept moving instead of fighting back. If he had greater numbers, uh, sort of like uh, Abraham, when... uh, He was, when we were reading about him, when he had, you know, all these fighting men, and he went to save Lot. You know, his nephew was was, uh, captured in that war, but he had the power in that culture to rally these troops and go get him. But in this case, there there wasn't big numbers of fighting men, and... uh, so he had to be conciliatory and keep moving on instead of fighting back. And he moves on trying again and again until finally he finds peace. He finally found a place where there weren't people who were going to argue that this water was theirs or they didn't like him. He finally found a place and was successful. Well, Sachs tells us that Isaac does not strive to be original. He doesn't try to make a name for himself. He just continues to fulfill Abraham's calling, and he alone stays in the land of Canaan. Abraham uh, had gone uh, out of the land. Um, Jacob goes out of the land, uh, leaves the the Canaan territory. But Abraham uh, and Jacob did go on down to Egypt But Isaac stays, and staying, he points out, this staying is a part of that characteristic of persistence, the courage to continually, uh, of continuity, and to continue to to be there. Um, Now, Sachs says it much better than I, and I want to read the the last couple of paragraphs um, in this. He says, 
Normally, we strive to individuate ourselves by differentiating ourselves from our parents. That's part of the rebellious youth kind of thing, this individuating, trying to be my own self, my own person. Um, And uh, I'm running into that with Bobby. He will agree to do something that he needs to do, a chore around the house, but he's going to do it on his time. (laughs) He won't do it when I want him to do it. And so rather than getting in a big fight about trying to force him, I understand he's at that stage of individuating. He wants to do it on his time. And so he'll eventually get it done when he decides to do it so he can exercise his own self stuff. Things like mowing the grass, you got to work harder. I've tried to tell him, if you mow it now, you can just mulch it. If you wait, you're going to have to bag it. And that's more work. He would rather individuate and work harder and bag it than do it now, or which was yesterday. So he's still got to do it. But anyway, we normally strive to individuate ourselves by differentiating ourselves from our parents. I'm going to do it my way, not your way. And we do things differently, or even we don't do them. Uh, And we give different names. Isaac was not like this. He was content to be a link in the chain of generations, faithful to what his father had started. And Isaac represents the faith of persistence, the courage of continuity. And that's something I hadn't stopped to think about, but it makes sense that Isaac was the first Jewish child. The first Jewish child. See, there weren't any Jews before Abraham and Sarah, and then they had a baby, and it's Isaac. He's the first Jewish child. And he represents the single greatest challenge of being a Jewish child, to continue the journey our ancestors began, rather than drifting away from it, but rather bringing the journey to an end before, uh, I mean, drifting away and bringing the journey to an end uh, before it reached the destination. And Isaac, because of that faith of the persistence, was able to achieve the most elusive of goals, namely peace, because he never gave up. When one effort failed, he began again. So it is with all great achievement. One part originality nine parts persistence. And he says, I find it moving that Isaac, who underwent so many trials from the binding when he was young, remember Abraham was told to sacrifice his only son. And so he bound him and he's getting ready to sacrifice him when the angel intervened and and then he saw the lamb uh, or the ram uh, caught in the thorn bush. But anyway, from the binding... Uh, when he was young, to the rivalry between his sons when he was old and blind. Uh, And he carries a name that means he will laugh. And perhaps the name given to him by God himself before Isaac was born means that the psalm means what the psalm means when it says, those who sow in tears will reap with joy. And I guess joy means you might be smiling real big and maybe laughing. You're joyful. You're happy. Faith means the courage to persist through all the setbacks, all the grief, never giving up, never accepting defeat. For at the end, despite the opposition, the envy, the hate, lie the broad spaces and then the laughter. Isaac, the serenity of the destination after the storms, all the storms along the way. That was an interesting aspect before we leave Isaac uh, and the the kind of review of our sense of of the anti-Semitism. Like I say, we, most of us, not all of us, but most of us in our Christian tradition aren't so sensitive and aware of the anti-Semitism. But... <clears throat> Uh, I remember uh, 
uh, a sociology essay I read a long time ago uh, that there are differences between um, those who persist and those who don't. And um, it was about, it was a, a sociological review of the folks who left Europe and came to the New World, the Promised Land, in a sense. Um, and then, you know, America has been looked at as the Promised Land. We've got Salem and, you know, a lot, a lot of names that are uh, from biblical times that people named places because they thought that that would be uh, a way of reminding themselves that this that we were a chosen people and that God was leading us to this new world uh, in that sense. Just like the Hebrew people or the Jewish people in the Old Testament, uh, it was being lived out by this conquering of, of, uh, of America and that the Indians were looked upon as the Canaanites that we had to defeat and conquer in order to possess the land that uh, God wanted us to have. But anyway, in this sociological uh, essay, um, it was saying that the personalities of those who would have the courage to risk to leave, you know, the potato famine of Ireland and, and some of the harsh conditions uh, that they were experiencing in Europe in order to risk this travel over to this new land and to get here. And it said a part of that was not just the courage part, it was the part of the lack of persistence, that they didn't want to stay and try and try and try again and again to make things work where they were. They wanted to go somewhere else. And a part of that, just pick up and leave, pick up and leave, pick up and leave, uh, and had a lot to do with our farming practice. We'd go wear out some land, and instead of figuring out how to rejuvenate the land with rotating crops and so forth, they just abandoned that farm and just went farther west and got another farm. And they'd wear out the, and chop down the forest and then keep moving on. Uh, whereas the folks who didn't do that, the ones who stayed in Europe and worked hard to struggle and figured out ways to survive, to persist where they were. And we look at the cleanliness and the orderliness of a lot of European cities and places that uh, where those that stayed took care of things <laughs> and, and treasured them and made them work, whereas the ones that didn't want to mess with that and just wanted to go away and, and keep trying new things, well, <clears throat> that characteristic, you know, led to a lot of inventions and new creations and all of that, but it did, uh, the flip side of that coin then becomes um, not taking care of what we've got. We can just throw it away because there's plenty more. And now we've gotten to a point where there's not plenty more. You know, the resources are scarce. And, and there aren't enough trees to suck up the carbon dioxide. And we still just think we can just go tear things down and, and things will take care of themselves. Or <clears throat> we can dump things into the ocean and the ocean will be okay. Uh, well, it, it doesn't. Uh, the East Coast um, has learned its lessons. I'm surprised um, at the... When I was in seminary in New York City, it was so filthy and dirty. And the, you could go over to New Jersey and look back across the river, and you'd see the big tall buildings. And the smog was so thick. You could see a few tops of uh, 
the tallest buildings, and you could barely see the ground, but this blanket of smog enveloping the city, and you try to look down some of the streets, you couldn't see a block into that smog. And then when we went on our choir tour, they have cleaned it up. All the taxis, they can run on natural gas. And some of them are even going to, uh, to electric, you know, charge them up and run electric vehicles. And, uh, and I, I remember that, uh, you know, when it rains here in Oklahoma and you walk around so often, you're walking in dirt and mud and your shoes get muddy. And when it rains, it gets dirty. In New York City, it was the opposite. All the soot and all the grime, when there was a big rain, it washed it away. And it became so clean. And it washed a lot of the gunk out of the air as well. And it was just the opposite. It was kind of strange. To, because usually here you got to worry about, you know, when it's rain, you can come in, you got to wipe your feet on the carpet or, you know, the rug outside. And you, but, no, I didn't get <laughs> I didn't have anything. <laughs> My shoes are clean. I've been walking around. But anyway, but there it, it just washed everything away and it made everything really clean and nice. But the next day on the windowsill outside the apartment... It's like somebody had taken a pepper grinder, big chunks of soot just falling out of the air. It's called particulate. Anyway, and that's what, you know, folks breathe in. But anyway, the city has taken measures to clean that up. Some of our rivers that used to be so polluted because we've got enforced the laws, you just can't dump uh, factory waste into the rivers. It has to be processed. We don't jump sewer lines into the river. And so the rivers have rebounded. They've come back. They've gotten, gotten clean. Well, that's the, the, uh, the virtue or the faith characteristic of persistence. To keep taking care of what we've got. To keep trying to make it work where you are. Uh, the, uh, gosh, I guess maybe... Well, and a little bit of that throw things away, the throwaway culture is we've got a lot of throwaway kids. Some people just, they want to have kids, it doesn't work, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Uh, the throwaway spouses, we just, you know, it didn't work, well, there's, there's another one out there, I'll just go find another one. Uh, instead of sticking to it and being persistent and finding ways to make things work, Uh, and to find what's good and take care of it and what's not right to fix it, to repair it, to make it, to make it work. Um, So that's, oh no, I had some more. We, uh, I had uh, a little bit about Rebecca and, uh, and it was speaking about um, as the other side that even though Isaac is very persistent, he is not a strong and aggressive kind of personality, but Rebecca seemed to have been. And Rebecca's love for her child Jacob superseded all other loyalties, revealing again the complexity of the world. But her actions might be regarded as treachery when she works up this scheme for Jacob to steal the birthright. Um, But uh, uh, Dan Dan Afuel points out, different from Eve, when Eve received a rebuke from God, when she went off and took charge of things and said, here, take this apple, it tastes pretty good, or whatever it was, uh, the forbidden fruit, she was rebuked, but when Rebecca takes charge and does what we think is deceptive and disloyal, uh, then there's no rebuke. But the primary loyalty she was supposed to have was to her husband, but her primary loyalty then becomes to her son. And uh, so... We'll deal more with that next week because there's, there's too much to go into 
in three minutes. So, any questions, responses about what we've covered?